Uh, welcome, y'all. How are you feeling? Yeah, feeling good. Feeling good. Good I'm, to be here. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming out, y'all. Uh, we have a little bit of an international team, a little international panel up here. So you're going to learn a ton uh, from these folks. And hopefully me, as an artist manager, too, I get to ask some questions that might be on your brain. Um, but we'll also have a Q&A portion. So please listen in and make sure you have some questions for the end. Cool? Cool. Let's get started. Who are y'all? Me first? Okay, cool. I mean, we got to give context before we hit into the conversation. So who are we talking with? So we're talking with me. I'm Stars. I work at Amuse. I'm the senior marketing manager at Amuse. Um, I'll start from the beginning, though. I'll start where things started for me. It was a cold and chilly night it when was I was born. It was a cold and yeah. dark night. Um, so I started in the music business when I was uh, 17, 15 years old, actually. Um, I, started work, I was working at a skate park. Through working there, I ended up uh, meeting people that worked at music marketing companies who ran events there. So I very quickly got to know them, figured out who they were, ended up doing work experience with them, um, and got offered a full-time job when I was um, 16. Um, so I did that, and this was at the dawn of the sort of social media era. So MySpace, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with MySpace. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it made us all coders, <laughs> and we all know how to make sparkly cursors now. Great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was at the beginning of that whole social media era. Um, so I was uh, hired to start the digital marketing side of this music marketing company. And through that company, I was working with pretty much every major label in the UK at the time, Island Records, Atlantic. And quite quickly, within six months, it was Island Records that asked me to come and join them. So I was very happy to, to do that. Um, and I worked with Island Records for three years. Um, sort of in the kind of digital marketing artist development space. So they would sign an artist and they would sit with the artist would sit with me for six months. Um, we'd figure out what do you want to look, what, do you, what does it look like? What are you saying? Like, what are we doing? Like, and just sort of help them figure out that, that out and that process. Um, so that's what I did. And by doing that, came very close with the artist and the management and realized that management was where it was at for me. Like, it was, it, I didn't want to be involved in just the beginning, just the artist development phase. Um, so I left Island Records and started my own digital marketing company to bankroll my management um, obsession. Um, and I did that and started developing artists. Um, one of those was a duo called Aluna George. Um, I sort of found them individually and, you know, George was making an EP. There was no female vocalist on it. I was like, we need to throw a woman in the mix here. We need to. So I found um, Aluna on MySpace <laughs> and um, put the two of them together. And then, you know, we stuck with that. You know, we, we were making music that felt very unique. Like, it couldn't be compared to another artist, um, you know, which made it really difficult in terms of getting a deal. But we stuck with it, and I eventually signed them to Island Records and ended up signing them to Inscope here in the US. Um, and they had, you know, multi-platinum hits and, you know, toured the world. Um, and Light. Yeah, right? <laughs> and, um, and then so I was working with them for five years, and then I joined the team um, of Gorillas. So I got a call, one of those calls just completely out the blue, like, is this Stars? I was like, yeah, this is Stars. Who's this? Damon. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is Damon Alvar, guys. Um, so, so, yeah, met with them, fell in love with them immediately. Like, we were totally on the same page. Um, and I started working with, with Gorillas, which I've been doing for the last six years. And then two years ago, I got the call from Amuse, who were looking for someone who had some experience in sort of global marketing campaigns. And, you know, me coming from a management background meant that I knew kind of every aspect of what that looked like. Um, so I joined Amuse two years ago, and that's where I am now. That's so exciting. Well, thank you from Amuse to here. And Mint, talk to us. Um, I'm also from the MySpace era. Um, I put my first punk rock records on MySpace with a player, and you could choose your top eight, and there was mad drama back then about all of that. Um, I started playing music when I was a kid. I can't even remember when, and then I started playing in bands and started recording records when I was like 16. Uh, and then I found out how to make beats on a computer with GarageBand, and then I went I skipped up until Ableton for some reason. I, someone just showed me Ableton instead of Fruity Loops or Logic, which was way easier. Uh, Ableton I learned first, and then that kind of got me into uh, um, you know, mixing and engineering and recording and um, producing just as, as much as I could, because I was playing multiple instruments when I was younger, but I wasn't really good at 
any of them. I was just good enough to write songs um, that were at least good enough to hire other people to play the parts better than me. And so producing on the computer was like the easiest way to just do that because um, if you have an ear, you can pretty much do anything. Um, and so that graduated into producing more seriously. And then in college, um, it really started to pick up. So I was terrible at first, like the absolute worst DJ in the world. Um, and then uh, back then, it was like very early SoundCloud days where people would like book you over like your like the amount of likes and the comments that you had, and I would actually get you bookings at festivals and stuff before you could buy those things. So I was touring pretty early. Um, I dropped out of college for it because I was making enough money that I could support myself. And then the whole electronic scene blew up, and EDM became the new term, and I wanted to make more. Um, less aggressive stuff, if, you, if I could put it that way. Um, you know, lo-fi, jazz, R&B, you know, I made classical compositions, I love sound design, um, but I really didn't know what to do with it all. Um, and so for some reason I thought New York would be a challenge to help me figure that out, so I dropped out of college and I moved to New York by myself. I slept on someone's mattress in a kitchen for like eight months. Um, and then I went to engineering school to get a degree uh, because you don't really get looked at if you don't have any like accolades for like major studios. And I started working in these little studios like Electric Lady and Quad, like some legendary studios, but I didn't like, I didn't like how they were managed. Like I didn't like how they felt so sterile. They felt very workhorse and they not, there was not like this creative inspiration that I went into these studios feeling. And when me and all my friends made music from bands jamming in a garage to producing beats in your bedroom or your dorm or your house and there was just like that energy. You didn't have that in these like really corporate studios and so I was like, okay, this is not what's gonna make me happy. So I started a studio in my house in Bed-Stuy. Um, that's called Arrowhead House. Um, and I've been there for eight years and then from recording studio, friends and connections, um, I started throwing events because I didn't really like how parties were also so, so uh, I don't know. It just seemed like there was not enough production level importance. There was like a really high ticket price. The sound was terrible and there was not enough diversity in the audiences or the music style. So I started throwing parties. Um, and then fast forward to now, I've had my studio area house for eight years. Shout out Ryan, Ryan Celsius over there um, who brought me into a muse about three years ago. Um, Cause I was, you know, bunch of different names we'll get to um, before I became Mint. But now I am a studio engineer, producer, who throws a bunch of different parties in New York. Sick, well thank, can we give it up for our panelists today? Now that we have some context, we can really get into the nitty gritty. But yeah, thank y'all both so much for being here. I mean, so many points made that I know we're gonna be able to put a pin in it and get right back to it. But tonight we are talking about the attention economy and that means, um, music marketing, right? So the attention economy being how long uh, can you keep somebody coming back for more and, and what does that take, especially today, uh, where we rely on sometimes just algorithms to tell us what's going on and how can we get back to the authenticity that actually builds community and builds really strong bases and longevity, right? Because we've seen so many hits come and go um, and how can we prepare ourselves for longevity and using moments like that for um, momentum and leverage moving forward but let's talk about, you know, how has the music industry and or marketing changed since our MySpace days, right? Like, what are some of the most critical things that you feel like, hey, I totally navigated this okay, or a trend that you see coming up from that time? Um, I mean, I think one of the things that was, you know, at the heart of things back then was... Um, being out there in the real world. So, you know, I met a lot of like-minded people by going to club nights, going to shows, and you know, that's where you find your tribe, your community, like that's where it happened. I think community is still very much at the heart of it now. I just think the challenge is there are, you're given so many different spaces in order to find that community on social media. It's like, which one works for you? Like, what's, how are you gonna utilize that now? Um, you know, so I think that's kind of um, the, the parallels of those two times, really. Yeah, absolutely, and Mint. Yeah, how has it changed since our MySpace days to today, good or for bad? Yeah, I mean, it was it was not as instant, instantly gratifying. Um, you had to wait 
for attention or views or likes or clicks of any kind. And so when you didn't get those instant gratifications or those reels or those reposts, you were like, okay, what didn't, what didn't people like about it? Or is this good enough? Like you were still Little challenged. Shadow work. You were, you were still yeah. challenged to like make stuff. And back when I started to tour, you weren't playing shows unless you had like 60% original music. They wouldn't book you. Now you can be a DJ, a, you can be a world famous DJ and not have any original music in a catalog on any DSPs or anything. So I think that is a massive change to now because you can literally just be a pawn and you don't really have to worry about the artistry. And back then you really had to be like good at making it and it was a challenge. I suppose that's a bonus too, right? Being able to, I think the, the wall's been broken down. So now social media allows you and distribution platforms like Amuse, you know, allow you to just jump straight in. You could release a song a day if you wanted to and you can create, you know, a whole concept around that. Whereas back when the MySpace days, you pretty much needed a record label to release music. That doesn't exist anymore. You know, you need to, all you need is to reach out to Amuse, really, or another, dish, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as someone who was in the MySpace era, I also felt like uh, today we look to our artists to be content creators and be the ones marketing and promoting. But like back in MySpace, it was like you really wanted to be loud and proud about being like the first one to discover this artist, have them on your top eight, have them as your song. Like there was a lot more ways where people could have been, you know, those early tastemakers. And I feel like we're still looking for that today, even with like, you know, the inundation of, of the industry and everything that's happening. But, you know, when we talk about the attention economy again, like what do you define the attention economy as right now? I mean, for me, it's uh, the attention economy is I like to see things as moments. So, uh, you know, as an artist, you know, you're releasing a track, an album or whatever. Moments can be, you know, the track coming out. A moment can be a piece of content that goes on a social media platform. A moment can be going live. So I think the attention economy is how many of those moments can you create while still being authentic to yourself and it being sustainable and something that you enjoy. So I think the moment, there's plenty of moments to be had, you know, and I think putting together a really strong campaign is about those moments. And the, you know, Discord or, you know, social me any social media platform allows you to utilize all these different surfaces in a way that will speak to your creativity. And they all don't speak the same, you know? Exactly. So something that, uh, you know, some marketers in here, if you're just learning, is that you cannot just put the same caption, the same photo on every social media. Like, you definitely do have to um, be very, uh, very poignant with what you're saying and where you're saying it, because what's going to hit on Instagram is it going to hit the same on Facebook and Twitter. And they make it really easy. Like, just share to all your socials. Um, organic posts and posts that speak to your community on that platform is already a part piece of marketing if you think about it that way and I, I've always believed in music can be released in seasons too like uh, there's music that I don't release in the summer there's music I don't release in the winter and fall and I feel like you know TikTok and things like that kind of stole that those moment those moments out of like you know User the natural experience yeah. The, yeah the natural progression of like how art's supposed to be because if it doesn't get like you can have something go viral and it has nothing to do with like the whole artist story and like like, you know, you look at Armani Blanco, you know what I mean? Armani White, like, Absolutely. he's been working for 10 years and that one song that would, like had the name Billie Eilish and that loop was his thing, but he'd been working for 10 years and how much good content did he have before that? But now we're in this TikTok generation, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's, it really depends on like what is the wave, but that kind of sucks out like the true reason that you actually started making art in the first place. A hundred percent. And I'm so glad you brought up Armani Blanco because obviously he had that moment. He used TikTok to really leverage um, that creation of that, that constant content creation that you have to do. But, you know, right before TikTok really took off, we had our Philly's own Tierra Whack doing these one minute videos and one minute songs that if it had come out today, a whole nother story. They would have been like, oh, she's just doing it for that. But how are we, how are we learning from these stories of um, making sure that your attention is monetized and is it does help you gain momentum? Like, how are we taking these 15 seconds of fame that it feels like today and creating longevity? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Well, I mean, Thank I, think, you. I think the beauty of the music industry is, is that you're always one 
song or one moment away from having that success. You know, and I think I'll go back to what I was just saying before about, you know, coming up with, you know, sometimes limitations are what give flight to creativity. You know, if you look at like bedroom producers, you know, sometimes you look back on those songs and you're like, they're actually way better than when I jumped in the big room. So I suppose those 15, the 15 minutes and the 15 seconds is, it's an opportunity, you know, to, to, to do something that, you know, that, that speaks to your creativity, you know? Um, yeah. We're going to talk a lot about longevity. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Mint? Um, I mean, with, I, I think it's just the same with everything. It's just consistency. Like, you don't know what you're going to capture one day, so you might as well just start, you know, just start. Um, because, you know, some, like, there's things that, like, I'll post, like, when Reels first coming out, I would just set up a phone next to my upright piano and just play you know, little riffs on it. And like, I didn't think that was that cool, but like a lot of people that never saw me play instruments were like running that up. And I was like, okay, I need to keep doing that. I didn't, I should have, probably will again. But like those little things, like you really never know what people are gonna gravitate toward your artistry for. So might as well just keep throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and seeing what oh, sticks. Oh, 100%, because after that 4,000, you know, likes on that reel, you're gonna post another one, it's gonna get two. Yeah, um, and that's I mean, there's okay. so much dumb shit out there. You might as well just make be good dumb art. shit. Be the best <laughs> dumb shit you've ever seen. No, but just the reality make good is, dumb shit. And and we we talked about a little, or you know, at least I explained it was like it's like it's like shadow work, right? Like you may think you you know your audience, um, but you don't until you stick that spaghetti at the wall. I actually want to bring up if anybody has a quick 11 minutes after this. Um, Jack Conti has a really phenomenal talk on YouTube, and he talks talks about funnels and feeding the funnel and that you get don't get to choose what you're famous for. And basically he really highlights this one singer songwriter, Irvin Berlin, who made over 25,000 songs in his life, like maybe actually put out 50,000 of them, but only won four awards in his entire life. So that's a 0.26% <laughs> of success on this man who's a prolific funnel feeder, right? So the more content you are able to put out and the more easier and accessible people um, and platforms like Amuse make it, that's how you are feeding your funnel. That is marketing. You get to have your community come to you even though you think you know them. Yeah, there's a lot of success stories in that space as well. If you look at Pink Panthers, for example, like her, she was just throwing ideas out there. You know, I don't even think she was looking at that. You know, originally she was like, didn't want to put her face out there. She was just using TikTok to be like, what does anyone think of this? Like throw it into the, to the, to the echo chamber to see what comes back. Um, and there's an artist that we work with called Snow, who's a lo-fi artist, who challenged himself to just put out a track every day. You know, and by doing that, he got this momentum, you know, and it was a creative challenge as well. So I think it's sort of, you can throw a lot of creativity at those limitations and just, uh, you know, like you were saying, it's just sort of throwing things out there and seeing what works and, you know, leaning on the community out there. But and it's, working it, through the cringe. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's hard. That's what I was going to say. It's hard. Like, you wake up and sometimes you don't want to make shit. I wake up months and I don't want to make shit. And that's okay. You know what I mean? But when you make stuff again, there's going to be someone that wants to hear it or or watch it, or see it, or look at it, or engage it in some way. So use it as an outlet no matter what. Absolutely. So now, I guess, you know, you brought up some Amuse uh, platform artists, obviously, meant you are one. Can you talk to us a little bit about how y'all identify talent at Amuse? Yeah, totally. So we've got, like, two different approaches. I'd say we've got a data approach and a human approach. Um, and we do a variety of different deals. Some are, you know, where we work with their catalogue and there's not any new music up front. There's some development deals where, you know, I think we all know that Amuse is a distribution platform and we have a label that grew out of that. Um, so we keep an eye on the thousands and thousands of releases that go through Amuse every week, every day. Um, and we can kind of see when a track is sort of, you know, starting to make some movements. And sometimes movements to us is, is no more than like 300 plays a day. You know, and we just sort of see that and, you know, we can sort of go, OK, there's something moving here. And then the human approach comes in and the label discuss as a team, like, I'm kind of feeling this and you bring it to the table. Is it worth sort of reaching out to them and seeing what they want? You know, so that was that's kind of what a development deal looks like. So it's that kind of seeing some positive signals um, and then the label team as a whole just kind of looking at it and going, there's some good stuff here. I think it's worth us throwing our expertise in the mix and just speaking to them first and seeing what they want. 
Um, so there's that. And then we also, you know, there's other artists that are doing, you know, big numbers where we kind of look at that and it's, you know, the numbers speak themselves. So that's the data approach um, that, we, that we use to kind of, you know, offer them a deal that works for them. Also, you know, retaining their independence because that's what Amuse does. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a human approach and a data approach and those combine perfectly um, so that we can offer them a really good deal that works for them. Um, you know, some, some deals have very little marketing budget because a lot of Amuse artists, they want to recoup, they wanna, they're running a business themselves, you know, they're independent artists, they want to see that monthly income come in. So we leverage our expertise to be able to work with them with very little marketing budget, and that's just bringing what we know to the table, our internal resources, our DSP pitching, you know, all of the resources we have in-house as well. So. So yeah, we, we do a variety of different deals. The catalogue, there's the development artists that are putting out, you know, they could be putting out a single every week and we get behind that. Um, and then there's sort of the sort of in-between, which is, um, you know, artists that are showing, you know, some, uh, some more promising signals. But, but yeah, it's a combination of the data and the human approach. And to me, that's so exciting. And to any artist, whether you have no singles out, your third album out, that 300 plays, like for that bump, that's, you know, a couple good posts on Instagram. That's a few DMs away. So thank you so much for letting us behind that curtain that we constantly are asking, like, was this post enough? Did I hit up enough people? Or maybe I'm not doing anything to get in front of these people. But it is those moments that you are creating for yourself and, and taking care of your page. Because what, 300 plays, again, like that, that's a good newsletter blast off. Off. That's a good, so, you know, taking those moments of consideration because you never know which table you're going to be at. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And Mint, you know, I'm really interested. Um, what can you do as an artist, as a business to best set yourself up to collaborate with people and platforms like Amuse? Build with your friends. Um, period. Period. <laughs> um, there's a lot to that, though, um, because those the friends come and go, collaborations come and go, sometimes things get soured, some things go forever. Um, but you really just wanna keep that, that hunger around you. And it doesn't matter if they're musicians, they can be graphic designers, they can be like the person that wants to help you with PR, they can be someone that keeps you posting on Instagram, TikTok, whatever. It can be someone who's trying to get you booked, it can be someone who like works at a venue and has like an in with a venue, it can be like someone who's got a spot at the bar. Like there's just a lot of people that you don't really think about when you're like building that. And I think it's just about having that like 360 zoomed out view of, of like who is actually gonna, like who really believes in me and like who actually is just down for me to like vent about this music shit or this art shit or whatever as long as possible and I think once you figure that out then like more things gravitate toward you and then that consistency comes in and when like you eventually have the blinders on and then you can just keep building and then the people that are supposed to be there show up like I've had some of my best friends come in my life the last two years and I'm 34 and you know, I've been doing this since I was 16 years old so like it really really depends but it's just all about art first making yourself happy and like building with people that you trust that believe in you and that you reciprocate that you know and and going through your page and then you know we had a quick you know little google hang last week to, to meet each other um what i really get from you and what really lands with me is your authenticity in in the people that you build with and community can you talk about what are some organic ways that aren't digital that we can be you know producing really valuable marketing moments with um, i know you're an event curator a community curator um what are some other ways that we for free 99 while we're balling on a budget can really be built building these communities together? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, Thanks. For, <laughs> for me personally, it, I, I had uh, an advantage because I had a studio. Um, so I was able to bring everyone into my studio and there was like three years where I didn't charge anyone. Like I didn't, like I charged clients that were, you know, that needed to be charged, but I really wanted to create an open door, revolving door of just a creative consumption and creativity in any, any form. Um, and so that was obviously a, an easier way to create that community, but it was really just um, like trying to give people a, a space to make art. And that doesn't have to be a studio, it doesn't have to be a nice one, just like a space to do things in. Um, a backyard, uh, your friend's bar or restaurant, just like a place where like there's a PA system or whatever. Like I, I grew up in a small town in Canada and there's still like open mic nights from that small town to like anywhere else you go in the world and just like taking advantage of things like that. But like I really think it just revolves around um, 
I mean, it really just revolves around like the people that you keep, you know, around you and just like consistently building with them, regardless of what that is, learning new things, like trying new shit out, like coming from, you know, MySpace into now, I never thought that we would have so much dependence on, you know, the app, the apps that we have now. And that thing, that's, that can get really daunting and really jarring. Like, how do I make this content that this person's making with a million viewers? Fuck all of that. You know what I mean? Just like, you know, keep people around that are as active as you. Um, and if they're not, they're going to watch you and they're going to stay consistent like you because that's what most people are afraid to do is stay consistent and stay working. Um, a lot of people in my life were like, don't do music, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, stop that. Like, there's no way. And I'm so glad I didn't listen to them and took the long road because I'm where I'm at because I didn't bend for anyone else that needed me to make more money or needed me to be more successful or for me to like make things I didn't want to make. Like there are plenty of opportunities that I could have made a ton of money as a DJ and played like made terrible music to get huge festival bookings. But that shit isn't authentic to you, yeah. Yeah, and like I think I, people see through that. It's so easy to to see through that when you're on stage and you're just like, you know, but like that's not making How music. How are you one more time? You know, Mary. but that's not like making music in like the studio when like everyone is like when that mute when that mix is like almost done and like your friends are around you're just like what the fuck did the we just make? Line, the There's binary, nothing that yeah. beats that feeling and you can't replicate that and the industry can't sell that and bottle that. There's no way you can do it. So just build with your friends. Build with your friends, y'all. And I hear a lot of be who you don't see. Right, I think it's very easy to fall. I know you y'all can give it up. Yeah, I heard the soul <laughs> clap with the snaps out there. Absolutely. Um, Incredible, thank you so much. And, and I'm so glad you got to hold space for that because it, it is about authenticity. And again, uh, we, we see a lot and we think we gotta be just like that, but we gotta be the best us um, and bring the best people because good people know good people, period. Um, awesome, I did wanna talk to you stars a little bit more. Um, so let's breathe a little bit of life into artist development because as a music manager, we are um, artist whispers where it's like my artist can just like lift his eyebrow and I'd be like, okay, he needs water, three teas, two towels, like we're good to go. Um, knowing artists at such an intimate, vulnerable level, how does that make you a better marketer? How does knowing them in that way uh, support you in telling their story or their team story? I think it's a combination of sort of, you have to know them incredibly well in order to apply that to what's happening right now. You know, like I was saying with Aluna George, they were making music that to most people, like, what is it? Is it garage? Is it R&B? Like, what is this? Um, you know, and it was, I was there, I was there going, well, I know exactly what this music is. I know there's an audience out there for it. Um, and the other thing that I had to consider was what are they comfortable with doing? You know, and so getting to know them really well was about me trying to tra like transfer that, you know, and apply that to surfaces, to like, you know, are they, are they happy to, how complex is it gonna be to turn around, a, you know, a very electronic sound into a live show? And, you know, what are they comfortable with showing of themselves on social media? You know, they, they were both very private people. So I think it's really important in artist development, but especially as a manager, to be listening to them and really, you know, not uh, being able to pr suggest ideas and ways to show up that feel really true to them and that also just speaks to their creativity and feels sustainable and something that they can actually enjoy doing. Um, you know, I think that was um, a huge thing. And, you know, it's very easy to just go, well, everyone's doing that. You know, if we just did that, exactly. for, like we would just get so far ahead. And I'm really glad I didn't have those conversations with them. You know, there was, you know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, George, he makes all the music, but he doesn't need to be in the photos. It was very important to Aluna that she had her, her producer there with her. They were a team, you know, and the, that, was, that was the artist's proposition. That's what they wanted to put across. So whether the label was saying, but you know, she's beautiful, it should just be her. But I was like, no, like this is what it needs to be because that's what Aluna needs and that's what George needs. It needs to be the two of them. So yeah. So you have to know your artist to fight for your artist to speak for your yeah, artist. Yeah, totally, and just sort of know what their needs are because Aluna wouldn't have been able to go and tour the world if she didn't have George there. You know, but like just creatively stars. and, you know, right. So yeah, I think it's sort of really knowing what their capacity is, what they're comfortable with, 
and then bring what I bring to the table in terms of understanding what the landscape looks like, I can bring the two of those together in a way that's going to really work for them. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So now that we know ourselves as artists, know our, you know, the, maybe the artists that we're managing better, knowing ourselves better, our community better, that's when opportunities come up, right? When we're being consistent with it. Um, and then opportunities like being a part of a Muses label might come up. So how does somebody who's in that opportunity to leverage um, a distributor, you know, what are, what are ways that they can leverage and A, bring things to the table, but B, get the most out of a deal? Well, I mean, I think it was very interesting that Ryan Celsius, who's in the room today, um, you know, reached out to you at a time when you really needed somewhere, somewhere yeah. to be. You um, know? When I met Ryan Celsius and we had been, you know, internet friends for a minute and um, we were talking about just coming onto a muse, I had this whole back catalog um, that I wasn't really doing anything with and I was, you know, self-releasing on TuneCore and DistroKid and all that stuff for years. Um, and the studio that I, I had moved into, it kept flooding. And like the time that I met him, my ceiling co collapsed like completely. And I lost probably like 20 grand worth of shit that I had been, you know, saving up my entire life for up until like 27, I think. And it was all gone. Um, he came through and was just like, well, outside of this distro and this marketing that we can give you, like, why don't we try to set you up in advance? And then we'll sign the back catalog so we can recoup it. And I was like, wait, so I can get paid more, I can recoup my advance with the old music, that was a no-brainer, and then making new music to recoup the advance, which just sets me up for way more distribution down the road and potential playlisting and new music. Plus, you don't want to just sit on old music anyways, and it's a kind of annoying to just like like look at your, your old plays and they still get circulated when you don't have any new ideas out. But that was like a really cool way that he was able to leverage my, you know, um, my hunger to like fix my situation, but like, it allowed me to just like re-inspire myself because not only did he reach out as a friend, but he reached out to me as someone who like believed in the whole vision, but not just my vision. Like he heard the whole vision with Arrowhead House, like my whole studio. And I like, I, sh I, I literally like cited and shouted out every single collaborator, every friend that I worked with. So he saw like, okay, this isn't just investing in Mint. This is investing in the whole ecosystem. And so that was like the most... That was like the most beautiful experience I've ever had in like the music industry up until that point, like actually. Because I've never had someone that like actually heard what I was saying, knew that it wasn't like a, hey, I need some money for like, you know, my chains and my shit. Like this is actually gonna rebuild my studio so I get my friends back in the room and then I'll get you music. And then also chains and shit. And then yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course. <laughs> no, thank y'all so much for sharing. It's, it's, again, incredibly important that we're having these conversations. This is what it's about, making this information accessible. So I'm going to put my music manager hat on and ask the blessed question that has no silver bullet, but I would love to hear, what does a, you know, what does an okay or like the baseline of a marketing rollout look like if I have a single coming out in like, August, you know, I, I hear whispers of, you know, you got to make sure you're good for three months before, three months after, and, and all the pre and post that, that goes into it is not just the release day and we're done and thanks for listening or not. Um, what does that look like in a perfect world for somebody that's some, for something that somebody can pick up anytime? Yeah, that's me. Um, so, <laughs> like, I mean, three months. I'm unconventional. <laughs> I mean, that's his marketing plan. Which, which does work, you know, I think people are attracted to chaos and that's a good thing. Um, so, I mean, I think, I go back to those moments I was talking about earlier, I think that three months prior to release, you know, it's funny, there's a lot of talk about pre-save campaigns, like do they even work? I don't know how many people actually check their, sit their like I songs do. or whatever you do. <laughs> Um, but I think the pre-save mechanic works because it's more just a, a tool to just remind people that something's coming. Whether they click the pre-save link or not, like having that lead in to the release, which can be, you know, two weeks, a month, you know, like you want to make sure that every time that you're talking about that pre-save that you've got something to support it, whether it's sort of like, it's photos, it's a video, it's sort of, you know, some piece of content to support it. And then I think once the track is out, 
Like, everything's out there at that point. So I think it's, how can you demonstrate that music a bit further? And those moments can be, you know, here's a little clip from the studio when I made it. Like, here's a load of photos. Like, here is, you know, me showing you the lyrics and talking a bit more about what the track's about. So I think the three months in and the three months afterwards are littered with these moments. Like, the pre-save before, like, those moments sort of, you know, offering up different sections of that song to, like... Because I think but before the track comes out, that's when you can actually have the most fun. Like, I'm going to give you 10 seconds of that here. Like, and get people really excited. I'm going to give you another 10 seconds here. Like, just get them really excited. Because once the track's out, it's then about telling the story about that track. You know, what, what's the song about? What was the process? So I think that's how you can really fill out a sort of four-month campaign. And I mean, so many moments that, you know, we, we don't think about because we think about having to create them instead of just documenting them. You know, how many sessions can you not just put a, a camera and just make sure that that's captured while you're already doing it in real time? And here at REC, you know, we talk about our, our curriculum and, and how we bucket these contents. It's help, hero, and uh, hub content. Um, basically, what you're saying is that we are going to create seven moments that you're giving to your community, whether that's a how-to, whether that's the BTS photos. And then on the eighth one, we're going to ask you to stream. We're going to give you a call to action. So whenever you're stuck or feeling like, you know, maybe I'm posting this flyer for the 30th time this week and it's really not hitting, um, ask what have you given your community in order to get that back. And then for me, back when I had my, um, you know, freelance days, uh, my newsletter would include templates to send out to bookers or, you know, how to fill out an EPK. So find out things that you do really well, whether that's production, um, photography, song, Grading and let people in. Um, you'd be surprised how many people would like to even digitally collaborate with you um, and make sure that you're creating those moments um, before you ask for something back. Because we all know that one person that posts the flyer 16 times, um, the event's tomorrow and they've sold no tickets. Well, there's there's been no connection made there. So think about the three ways that we create content, help content, right? What do we do and how can we help others with it? That's the kind of stuff that we're going to hashtag really well. So when we're putting it up on Reels. People that don't follow us are discovering and finding that. The hub content, once they're in your ecosystem, how are you keeping them in there? Your, your Q&As, you're feeding the stories. And then that hero, right? Watch this documentary. Listen to this album. Stream this project. Um, I know that specifically that's been really helpful for me on the indie tip. No, um, letting them in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build off because that's, you know, huge. And especially while we get more and more reliant on, you know, this instant gratification, these apps, the swiping and the, you know, the, the, the mindless scrolling, uh, people want to see some depth. Um, but that can break into so many different facets. Like, you know, those little Russian dolls that just like keep getting smaller yeah. and smaller. Like you can look at your release like that. So for me, like I said, I'm unconventional because I do it. A totally different each time because I, I get bored easily. It's how I am, like OCD out the ass. So I want to make sure that my really, and I'm also very over the song when it's done. Very, oh, yeah, you don't want to hear it ever again. Because I, I, I'm meticulous about my mixes, and then by the time it's mastered, I'm like, cool, you guys have it now. But that doesn't mean that the fans are going to feel that way. So you have to keep recycling it. So one thing that I always rely on first is, like, of course, pre-saving and emails is huge, like email blasts. I don't do them enough, but some of my most like prominent musician friends have always put work into their their MailChimps or their email blasts and just like even when people are working even when people are at you know their day job they're, they're always, always in that inbox <laughs> yeah there's always going to maybe be a click to open whatever and it you, it might not make a huge bump in the radar but it's going to make something happen but um BTS footage of you know art like the first images of like the the graphics. If you make a video, uh, each new release that I make, um, I normally edit or like record a video myself. So either my friends that are videographers will film an actual video, and then we'll spend like two or three months just like putting out teasers, like proper ones. But they don't have to be proper. Like we'll grab a, a handy cam, you know, we'll grab like an eight millimeter, we'll use like the phone and put a filter on it. But there is something in like the buildup of the actual video, even if it's the teaser. The teaser can even just be like a teaser itself and, the, and like the final product is the song. But if you have a whole music video, then you have like two things to market. So if you have a graphic, a visual, and the song, you have three things you can dissect for months. So that's kind of how I've done it. But I always rely on, you know, good art that actually can like, you can kind of deconstruct and good 
that's much better, sorry guys. And good videos or good graphic content that you can actually like continue to promote if you don't like the song anymore. So if you don't like the song anymore, maybe you really like the stills or like videos of the, or clips of the video like or that. Or some user generated content, encourage other people to make yeah, it Yeah, like you. It just, <laughs> just what, like literally whatever, you know? But like if you can pull apart your release and like kind of branch it into like three different mediums, then you're, you're gonna be way better off than just having like a pre-save and a song because that's kind of it. And now that's kind of like two dimensional, just having like an art and a song. And then now you have to like post a selfie because that's algorithmically better than your it art loves itself. The face. You Use know, those and that's, sliders, y'all. And I hate that shit, but everyone loves that shit. So like you have to have something else that continuously stimulates and maybe reminds you, you know? I love that we all rolled our eyes at having to post a selfie to get the algorithm working <laughs> because it perfectly segues into something I want to talk about is um, being anonymous in music. You know, for a lot of artists, they find, especially for private ones or people that want to keep that separate, that that is a route that, that people do want to take. And how does it help or hinder or both uh, the progress of, uh, of, a, of an artist? And I know you have a specific story with, you know, going from one to another, but talk to me about it. Yeah, I mean, that depends fully on the person, the artist, and like who represents them and works for them because you don't really know what they're trying to market. But Mint was an anonymous project for two years. Um, I, had a, I had like four different collaborations and names before I became, before I chose Mint. Um, and I released music for two years completely anonymously because I didn't want anyone to attach the other sounds to this new sound. Um, and I thought that was really cool until it wasn't. Um, it, it, you need to kind of have, if you're gonna go fully into the anonymous, then you like have to do something that's like, you're really investing in that anonymity, which is like actually impossible to do if you're like touring. And that's a huge, it's also an expense. You know, so eventually the veil has to come off, and also people want to see who that is and behind it. So you're either like fully going in, like full metal, like full speed ahead, on like anonymous artist where you have like you know a, a covering, or you eventually reveal what that artist was or who that is. And I I was in a small enough community, so everyone eventually knew who it was, and I got an agent and a manager with with only six songs released, and everyone was mad because everyone in the community was like. Why is this artist getting, who is this artist that has six songs or three songs and has an agent and is touring? And then when I relieve, relieve, revealed myself, everyone's like, oh, he's been doing it for five years. But that doesn't, it's not the same trajectory for like everybody else. So my situation is very unique. But I also wanted to connect with people. So like I didn't want to just be an anonymous person. Like I enjoy going to shows, I liked hosting events. I liked having my studio as a space to go, so it only lasted as long as it could. But it felt really empowering because there was no judgment about me, how I looked, what I made. It was just what the music made people feel like. And that was really powerful. But it has, you know, a trajectory that could be short if you don't, you know, do it the right way. Or it could be way too long if you do it really good and then you're stuck being like Marshmallow or someone. No shade to Marshmallow. I heard he's right over there. He's ready to fight. So talk to me a little bit, Stars, about even your work with Gorillaz, where you go from a person and then their, their four characters and, and their personalities and, and the storytelling that goes into that. You know, who, how do you choose what you're marketing at the moment? I mean, so again, similarly to when you're an anonymous kind of artist... Um, it has everything has to be very thought out with a virtual uh, character, so it goes as deep as like character traits documents. Where I've read them. Two D came shipped in the box, all so taken apart. They're all, they're living and breathing people, as far as I'm concerned, because that's how much work goes into them existing online, you know, and them showing up. Like one of them has their own Instagram page, and you know, they they're constantly showing up on TikToks, doing duets, and you know, doing things that I don't think any other virtual character if there, if there are any people yeah yeah so essentially it's um the beauty of it though is we aren't limited by location we can if we want one of those characters to show up in argentina tomorrow we can source a, an image of google we can get some stock video from somewhere and, and there, there they are right there but i think the biggest challenge really is to sort of how do you build that connection between the audience and those characters so that 
they do remain interested. And, you know, there's a lot of, like, multi-platform storytelling that we do to, in order to allow fans... And there's a lot... We actually write an entire narrative before any... Whilst they're in the studio, so obviously Damon Albarn is the music end of Gorillaz and Jamie Hewlett is the art side. It always works best when they are in each other's orbit for that music making process. It's it, chemistry. It's chemistry, you know, the art has to speak to the music. There's um, chemistry between the artists and the fans too. Exactly. And the anonymity kind of sucks that out if it's totally, not totally. overdeveloped like that. Yeah. Um, so we re rewrite an entire narrative at the beginning. Which, so we have two parallel running narratives. There's obviously the real life stuff. Gorillaz just came off, uh, you know, an eight-month world tour. Ended in Miami, you know the vibes. Yeah, right. And it was, yeah, they performed to like, like 1.5 million people. Um, you know, so the challenge there is how do we force in the characters into that space? Because you've got a 14-piece live band on stage. You know, so it becomes all about the screens and, you know, the, the, band, the musicians are often quite silhouetted and, you know, it's about sort of forcing those two worlds together in a way that makes sense. Um, whereas if you look on Gorilla's Instagram, you won't see human beings very often at all. You know, and that's a brand rule that exists for gorillas. Because if we just took the shortcut and went, oh, but people know who Damon Albarn is. Why don't we just put some footage of him up there? Why don't we use his likeness? And it's like, no, we've got a story to tell here and we're going to stick to that as a brand rule. You know, so it, it, it's, it has its limitations, but it's always an interesting challenge to, you know, TikTok was especially a very interesting challenge for us this year. Um, you know, figuring out, because a lot of those tools on TikTok, they're only available. Yeah, you can't, like, you can't fake those. You know, you can't fake, although we did fake a duet. So there's lots of uh, duets that we faked on there. But, but it, you know, it's by putting a, a phone in front of a phone. Like, we weren't given any sort of special access for that. Um, but yeah, I think we are guided by a narrative and we stick to that and some brand rules. And, you know, we make sure that we prioritize putting the characters front and center. No, I love to hear that and, and really wanted to connect, obviously, the, the piece of uh, what it is to market ourselves versus, and specifically in uh, your, your situation, um, you work really hard to empower people in a muse um, and really empower that storytelling as well. So um, can you talk to us about the way that even through a muse that we approach storytelling and, you know, how we're benefiting our artists? Yeah, so I think every artist is different, you know, and they've got their own priorities. Like, there's an artist that's releasing an album from next year who completely shies away from social media. Um, you know, he's a very tortured soul. Um, you know, the and, best star. Right. Um, and so we had to come up with a way, you know, in collaboration with him, how can we show up online without putting you front and centre? So we basically came up, we took the narrative of the album, which is, you know, about, you know, a particular struggle that he went through. And we are casting an actor to kind of play him in certain, in, in a short film, in order to sort of be able to speak, get that story across. So that's what works for him. And then, you know, other artists like Yacht Club, who has just gone platinum in the US, for him, you know, he's an indie artist. He makes everything himself. Um, it was really important for us to be able to, you know, suggest things that he could do that sort of speak to him. You know, we faked an MTV Cribs episode for him, which was amazing. Um, you know, just walking around his, like, one-bedroom apartment in Nashville and just showing you the, you know, the home studio, the laptop being there. And, you know, it was a way of... Because I think it's really important to be able to get personality across. It's what, the, you know, the music speaks for itself and providing as much sort of... Um, airtime to the music as possible is great, but I think sort of pulling, pulling the curtains back and being able to sort of get to know the artist is super important as well, because I think that's how you strengthen the bond with the fan from going from casual fan that, you know, might listen to the music on Spotify but doesn't really hit up the socials very often. It's that kind of content, that sort of personality-driven content where you sort of deepen that relationship with the fan. So for him, it was about how can we, you know, because he had a viral track on TikTok, but we were like, no one knows who he is. Like, they don't know what he looks like, what he has to say. So with him, that was the challenge. And that's when we came up with a, a few different content series in order to be able to get that across. 
you know, and again, that's totally in collaboration with the artist. What's he comfortable with? You know, he doesn't take himself very seriously. So ripping off MTV Cribs was a great way to be able to do that. The parody, the breaking of the fourth wall. Exactly. Now, and I love it. And that just goes all the way in and, and knowing these artists. Um, and let's talk a little bit more about, you know, I, I love the authentic and human approach that Amuse has to their artists. Um, what is other things that y'all do differently uh, than a CD Baby, a Distro Kid, et cetera? I mean, I would say that Amuse sort of acts entirely in the artist's interest. You know, we're there to support what they want and bring our expertise to the table. Um, you know, we offer incredibly artist-friendly deals. You actually get a lot of communication from our label team. You know, we make ourselves available, like I was saying earlier. Even when we've done a deal where there's no marketing budget, it doesn't mean that you won't speak to the marketing team. You'll hear from them. And I'm sure you've all seen Amuse's socials where we put a lot of work into kind of educating our, our user base. There's a lot of work that goes into articles that we write about, you know, being, bringing information to the table. You know, there's a lot, we have a very sophisticated data side of the business, um, which we're, that we've had access to for a little bit, and we're slowly making that available to all of our artists as well, and I think that's a huge part of Amuse being able to give you that insight into exactly how your fans are coming to your music on Spotify, their save rates, their, you know, all of the, you know, the TikTok data. So we're working to sort of bring more of that to the artists as well, and I don't think other um, distribution platforms or labels give artists that level of access. And I think Amuse is, is front and center for that. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I know we have a bunch of questions as well, but I definitely want to hear from Mint. You know, uh, we talked about getting the bag, the bigger opportunities that just didn't align with you. And sometimes for a lot of people, that's the difference between signing to a big label and finding a more boutique label or, or you know, more hands-on label. Um, what are the pros and cons of, of both as an artist? Well, the pros of a major label is obviously the financials, but you owe that back. So you're almost immediately in debt. And if you don't do the exact same trajectory that they have in, plan, in, in mind for you, then you're in debt like immediately. But if you sign with a, a smaller distro or label, you have control creatively and you also have the ability to choose exactly when you want to attack and when you want to like go in the studio and when you want to play shows and things of that nature. And I always wanted to keep you know, going back to your question, like what are like the free ways to like build community and like my first, my first, you know, stab at all of that was making mixes. Um, I wasn't the best DJ, but I kept making sure that if I wasn't practicing on vinyl, I was practicing beat, beat, make, beat matching on, you know, Ableton, or when Serato came out, I tried that, or just like having, you know, it was like those little shitty controllers before they even had like the tractor controllers and all that stuff. Just like putting out like compilations of our, like my music was like the only way that I could freely do that and just get content out, even if I wasn't inspired enough to make it. And like a big label isn't gonna want you sitting around on their money making mix tapes or mixes or compilations but yeah, totally. you know another smaller distro or another smaller company will be down with that and invest in you because like that's how you're getting your you know Part dust of the process yeah dusting the cobwebs off and just like getting re-inspired because my mixes were like really really popular when I was least active producing because it was just like a catalog of music that was what I was listening to and I was educating a bunch of people that didn't know what that music was, what I was listening to. So that wasn't more just I'm like an artist, I was just a curator, I was like a tastemaker, if you will. But I didn't consider it that, I was just making music in my, I was just putting songs together in my bedroom, hoped that it would work and it would eventually turn into like congruent mixes later once I got good enough after years and years and years of practice, but that was like, a non-pressured situation because I was never doing anything for someone else. I was doing it and I was like the one putting the money up for the tune core or the distro and like seeing it would come back to your PayPal every three months or whatever. But like still when you're like younger, you're like, wow, like someone bought my music on Bandcamp or whatever. But then all that time in between, you're still circulating and like getting through all these catalogs of music and kind of just like getting through this, you know, this sludge of the writer's block or whatever it might you know you you ugh, you might have you know but i think the bigger label deals kind of steal that patience away from your process and someone like amuse kind of re-inspires you to keep doing it as long as it's what you want to do. Yeah, totally. Kind of like democratizing the process, really. Leaving yeah. it in the hands of the artist that we would never want to jump in and get them to do something that, that didn't work for them. You know, so it really is a case of us 
collaborating with the artists, you know, they're in the driving seat and we're in the back seat, you know, just sort of like backing them up and supporting them and, you know, listening to what they want and what they need and us giving that to them. So, yeah. I mean, I even think the latest uh, Bronk Hampton and Kevin Abstract drop, right, where Kevin Abstract during the interlude was like, I'm doing this because my label needed a 35-minute uh, project, and this yeah. is exactly 35 minutes. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you never wanted to get to there. And, and with big, big labels come big illusions, come big plans, come big loans. Um, like you said, that you have to pay back. And um, for some people who already have themselves as a business, that's a little easier to stomach. But for someone who maybe has never even had a manager, and just had a song take off, it's a really scary place to be. So um, one of the final questions, you know, who are people that you need on your team to protect you and to grow with you and market? I mean, I would say a manager's a really good start. You know, a manager, I would say your manager and, you know, eventually your lawyer are probably the two people that work most in your interest. You know, because they, if you win, they win. You know, whereas a label, labels and things like that, there there's too many other factors involved in that. So I'd say your your manager and your lawyer are your two biggest, you know, yeah. advocates. Well, whoever two. can help you cut out the noise yeah. outside of the studio, you know, or the creative process. And I think those two are the most important for sure. But to your point earlier as well, it's it's your friends around you as well. The yeah. ones that want to create that, with you. That's, that's also can be important. your friends, you know. Yeah. Um, but also just like someone who can capture your like capture you. You know, photo and video. Just have someone that's just always there. Yeah. I you know, you can use that, you know? Awesome. And yeah. I mean, to wrap this up, um, talk to us a little bit about what you would leave uh, these amazing folks here today with in terms of music marketing and the attention economy. You know, how can we be doing, you know, step one level things to really set ourselves up for success moving forward? Or what, what is one thing a day that we can be doing and be consistent with that would really support us? I think it's um, I think it's about coming up with a concept that you can sort of apply your creativity to, like set yourself a challenge of you know maybe it is me showing up, you know every day doing something, or you know maybe it is a case of, um, you know coming up with a content series that you're happy to roll out on Instagram or whatever. You know I think it's uh, I would say that th putting a concept together that you can throw yourself at would be would be an amazing thing to do. I second that concepts, you know, think of music as seasons is something that always helped me like what, and that can be moods too, but yeah, conceptualizing something that you can always re-inspire yourself with the art or the, the marketing or the visual, because you might not always love the music through the entire process, but you can still love aspects of it and just always be unapologetically and authentically yourself and only do it for you and don't take shit from anybody. Yes. Ever. I love it. Well, can we give it up for our panelists? Thank y'all so much. So we do have a Q&A section. So like I asked so kindly at the top, if y'all have been tapped in and have some questions for our lovely guests, hit it. We got William right around here with the mic, and then he'll grab it and move it around. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Henry. Uh, Thanks, you guys. One, thanks for coming out. This was fantastic. And I had uh, two quick questions for you guys. Uh, one was, as an artist that really has a very minimal following right now, from your guys' perspective, do you think, I've been kind of considering things like running Instagram or TikTok ads to try to kind of reach out and try to find more of a community. Do you guys think things like that are worth it? I do think they can be worth it. I mean, on TikTok, you can run Spark ads, which are just essentially like boosting a particular... Uh, video. I would say that also there's newsletters that you can sign up to, particularly from TikTok, that will let you know what their music programming is. So there might be a particular week where they're pushing, a new, they regularly push the, the new music. The Trends newsletter? Yeah, the Trends like newsletter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they'll let you know what their programming is. And I would, I would say that's a really good framework if you, if you are on TikTok, is to sign up to those newsletters because they let you know weeks in advance that you know this week they're going to be pushing the indie music hashtag or you know they might be pushing the new music hashtag. So it can also be a really good uh, challenge, you know, if there's a hashtag that speaks to you and you want to jump on that. But I'd say that's a really good way to sort of ride a wave on there as well, especially if it's something that you can creatively get on board with. Um, and I would say the um, other ads that have worked really well, I mean, Spotify, I find that it's sometimes really interesting that you can have a massive ecosystem or a much bigger ecosystem on a streaming platform. But it's like, how do I bring them over 
like, you know, to, to the socials. Um, but there are tools that Spotify offer, like there's the audio ads, which are, you know, can, can be quite cost effective. And they've just reduced um, the, the, uh, the, the sort of allowance or the benchmark price that you have to go in at for a thing called Marquee, which is super useful as well. But because um, that sort of means that you're not sort of bringing people from socials to there. You're kind of, you know, staying within the platform, which is really good. Um, and yeah, I've, like Instagram advertising, things like that. Like it's it's difficult. Like to sort of you've you, you've got to kind of e like educate yourself on the on the targeting and you know things like that. But you know there's a, there's trial and error to be had there. But I think that TikTok spark ads are, are really effective, and I think audio ads are marquee on on spot on Spotify is great. I wish Instagram still let you like. Do you, can you still promote ads on like landscape videos? Or is it just reels now? I can't. You even... can upload a landscape video, but it will come up as a reel. See, yeah. I would have had I would have had actually tangible advice for you three years ago because I would only use visual snippets and I would keep it to like a rule of thumb, thirty seconds or one never over a minute. But now you can do like a whole hour, which is insane to me. But back then, you could. I would. I would never. I wouldn't really target ads towards photos or something static. It would always be like a visual of something, and even even if that's just like footage of you living in the world or not even you or just like some visual content that's stimulating with like your music as the soundtrack, I would boost that and that would actually give me a ton of new followers. I, we never know how long they would stick around, but like that was a little bit of new attention on that piece of art. It was just through a different medium. So if you can still do that with a reel, you can still do that with vertical and long form, but a good rule of thumb is like not too long, make it visual and just soundtrack your music to other visual snippets. I would also just say, on Instagram, what I found really works as like an introduction tool, is if yeah. you made like an about me video, which is like, you may not know who I am, but this is me, a very short kind of intro video, those actually go down incredibly well when you're targeting on ads, because it yeah. gives them an introduction, and yeah, it's pretty good. Thank you so much. Um, I also had one more quick question. Um, you guys were talking earlier about um, kind of like rollout times, and you guys were throwing out three months a lot, and I feel like, at least mentally for me, that rollout release time bandwidth has been largely like a month. I submitted to just like DSPs about a month before release and I spend that month promoting. But do you guys think it's more beneficial to try to give yourself even like upwards of like three months for that? I'm on the month train or yeah. shorter. So just do you. But the three months is just long enough for you to create real campaigns and conceptualize it. So it really depends. If you have your concept already built out and you're zoomed out and you already have it in, in motion, that three months can be three weeks. And if it's consistent, and you have stuff every couple of days, then that's all you need. It's just like packing that in to that same amount of time. It really just depends on like how much content you have ready for it and how much you want to do after the yeah, fact. I think I think a month is great for singles, really. When I yeah. say three months, Projects, we're talking though, about big, longer. you know, three to five, like, E, like an EP three to five and then you know maybe eight plus tracks on an album yeah. um, it's really dissecting and forgive my language you know using every piece of, of the animal right there's the album there's the singles there's the John's that didn't even make it into being a single the BTS um, the, the visuals BTS, the, the art the B-sides um, so making sure that when we are looking at our project as a whole, we are separating those moments that stars talked about. That's the lyric breakdown. Yeah. That's your collaborators. That was who did your artist. Um, and you'll find that you'll have a lot more to post about that isn't just the same album cover. Exactly. Thank you, Henry. Right over here. Hi, my name is James. Um, I was curious what you guys' opinions was about uh, those websites where, you know, you can hey, Spotify curator playlist people to, you know, check out your music and possibly put it on. I know some of them are, like, maybe, like, I don't know, bots or, like, even sometimes there are people who, like, don't actually have, like, a following in music. They're just, you know, they signed up, they got approved, and now they just take money. Uh, yeah, what are your opinions on that? I would say the um, be very careful with those because it, it tends to be, in my experience, a waste of money. Yeah. Unless the people that you're speaking to actually own playlist networks where they've put a lot of time into curating those playlists. I would never go for anyone that's, that claims they're speaking to Spotify editors because they're not. 100% mm -hmm. they are not. I've yeah. personally never had good luck with them. Um, even me and, when me and Ryan Sully started working together, we would both try to tag team them and they were never really picked up I had more playlisting on just natural organic releases than I did spending, you know, a hundred bucks for credits to see if like some dude in Taiwan with a million TikTok followers would post my thing to <laughs> on, his fitness on, on video. On Shub? 
<laughs> so, but like, you never know. I know some kids that like just, you know, I don't know, maybe they had a trust fund and had money to burn and they did that shit and they, maybe they got viral one time. But if you have limited resources, just keep your work consistent and just like try to just continue to find exactly what is either trending or what Spotify, like, you know, all the curated Spotify playlists, there's like trends in there, but just be careful for you sure. Also, um, there's a lot of independent playlists on Spotify yeah. where they'll have an Instagram page and you can just put together a mailing list yourself. Yeah. And speak to them. And you can like connect their them. profile to like an Instagram sometimes. So like due diligence where you can like find like if that artist actually, if that curator actually has a playlist and it's as big as they say, just do some background check. If it doesn't connect to anything that you can like click or they have like a online presence that's not real, then they're a scam. There's much. also music recommendation accounts that I found to be quite a good way of getting your music out there on TikTok. It's kind of like the TikTok version of a playlist. Yeah. It's quite cool I think too. it's called Gen Direct is a really good R&B one that's on TikTok and Instagram. But yeah, and I mean, these these aggregation services are, are like, you know, are, are getting outsmarted. I remember that about two years ago, there were a bunch of people right before their rap came out, all their... Their, their views or listens went down because they cracked down on, you know, who these actual listeners were. So the, the, they're getting smarter in reading this data. So it might be really instantly gratifying, but I think that the, the, the key word of today's, you know, talk was longevity and, and keeping it organic so that you can keep it for as long as possible. I'd also say just today, I think, is the deadline if anyone's uploading videos for their wrapped because Spotify are letting Wasn't you... Wasn't it the 23rd? Don't play with me. Or maybe it's the 23rd. Maybe okay. they've extended it. Okay. It was the 18th. I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll be but like, yeah, was definitely it? make sure you do that. Yeah, so you get to say a shout out to like all your top listeners and all that good stuff. So download Spotify for artists. Keep an eye on that data. Hi. First thing, I'm Jordan. I want to say amazing presentation. Thank you very much. Also, for an aspiring marketer, an aspiring manager, What's some advice you can give us who are starting from ground zero that want to get into the business and break new artists? I would say what I found really helpful when I was starting out was I kind of, um, I used Instagram and I used social media just to kind of see who was out there. You know, I'd, I'd figure out who does work at these labels, who does work at, who, who does, you know, that band's PR. And I started you know, reaching out to people just to sort of build a network myself. You know, I'd look at, you know, artists that I'd want to work with and, you know, I'd find out who their team was. And, you know, I'd, you know, when I first started managing Aluna George, there was a producer called Hudson Mohawk, but who was, who was super inspired, who Aluna, right? And, um, you know, and he's just had viral success on TikTok as well, which is wild. Um, but it was, I, because he was such an inspiration to, the, to them, and no one knew who Aluna George were at this point, but I sent him the music. He doesn't know me. He got back to me within five minutes and just said how great it was. So I would say, you know, look for, if you've already got an artist, no one knows who they are, see if you can find who their peers are in the music space and look into who those teams are. You can find them on Instagram. You can find them on LinkedIn. You know, also with a bit labels. of digging, you can find their email address somewhere. LinkedIn is such a sleeper for all creatives. Like, that's where people who work at Spotify are at, you know? So. And people put their emails in their Instagram bios now. They do, they which do. Which is not around when I was a kid. And quick rule of thumb, <laughs> if you see an email, do not DM. That will fall into a void. Yeah, um... And then as, as someone just breaking artists, um, just diversify the artists that you want to work with. You know, don't pigeonhole yourself with one genre. Um, and always make sure that the people that you really want to represent are consistently outputting and are hungry enough that like, instead of going out on a Friday night, pay attention to the kids that aren't going out on a Friday or into the lab. You know what I mean? Like pay, pay attention to the kids that like put music out and like don't really care, don't aren't like looking at how many likes they got. Like listen, like pay attention to the kids who are like really just trying to put art into the world and they're yeah. really consistent about it because they'll never let you down. I also think that from a management perspective, I'm always attracted to artists that have, you know, a real vision and that like I have a pretty good and idea about what they want. Don't know what to do anything else but they, art. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like I've, that, I've got this incredible vision. Like I know who I am as an artist. I just don't know what to do with it. I love that. That makes my job a lot easier. Awesome, great question, thank you. Hi, my name is Nadine. Um, thank you very much for everything you're sharing with us tonight. Um, on nurturing our audience as independent artists, uh, have you said 
uh, a lot tonight about uh, how important it is to give as much as possible um, before the ask, before the uh, call to action. And I'm thinking about email marketing. Like for those of us who are starting with just the resources that we have so far, we may not have the studio, we may not have the this, we may not have the that, but we have uh, an email uh, list, right? And all of these different social media markets and all of that stuff doesn't actually belong to us. Anything can happen with them. But if we attract those audiences to our email list, that's somewhere where we can actually have uh, direct communication with our audience. So I'm thinking about, um, you know, for us with a vision and a story to tell, like what's the best way to leverage our email list, right? You know, for like our MailChimp, our MailerLite, whatever it happens to be, to tell our story, to share the vision, um, and, you know, before we get to, you know, the album or the whatever it is, the project, like what's, because I'm thinking about what you said, the, the three months before the release and then the three months after, having a, crafting a kind of a campaign, like a long range campaign that tells the story, like what would be a, a really great way to approach like using uh, our resources with email, for example? Yeah, I mean, two really great points, right? We don't own Instagram. We could all literally get up right now and Twitter's down or gone, right? We'd know a lot close. of people who would lose this their, might be down their right job, now. their livelihood. It's, it's really real. We want to LOL, we want to get our jokes off, but there are people losing their literal livelihoods off of Twitter. So really owning our data, right? Our websites, please. Websites are such an incredible tool and they are a monthly fee or whatever you want to do, but um, so worth it to have your own universe. You are crafting the colors, the experience, what they see, what they don't see. And number two, um, what I specifically am doing as an independent you know, manager is um, exclusivity. So now that you do have all, because when you pr when people pre-save, those, those three, five, six emails that you get, that needs to be dumped into a bigger uh, newsletter uh, campaign that you can then and trust that these people went ahead to even do this, to even give you the information, um, and then create an exclusivity within that, right? Because you are part of this email campaign, we have a marketing budget. And marketing budgets are, have you ever gotten a free t-shirt from where you're at? That is a marketing budget. That is money put aside to create things yeah. that people will wear and bring around with them. And when they see somebody else with that on, they know that they're part of something unique and, and intimate, and, and uh, that's their connecting tissue, right? So I really see a lot of, uh, you know, longevity and, and really value when, you know, someone who hasn't asked for anything for me, but I send them, uh, you know, a, a special, a special, you know, instrumental or a handwritten card because I also collected that on my website, right? What was their address, their size? Um, so that we can do special drops like this for people like that. Yeah, it'll take a hundred, 200 bucks, but that's stuff that we can put aside, but that creates a moment with the people forever. I actually think it's a really interesting challenge to make mailing lists fun again. You know, I think it, I think make that, mailing lists <laughs> fun again. Yes. You know, because I think they they sign up there because they want things first. But like, how do you come? I think applying a concept to that, which makes it really interesting. Like, I always think when I go to someone's website and they're pre they're presenting their mailing list as more as a fan club, I'm always way more inclined to join it. You know, so I think it's if you frame it in a way that makes it feel like, you know, you're joining a club and, you know, you've got to think about the language you use to communicate yeah. on those lists as well. Like maybe it's you want to be more personal and you want to give give more on that list. But I think it's a, it's an interesting. Um, I do that. Yeah. I do that with um, some of my a concert series. So I have um, four or five main concert series, but one of them is an Afrobeat dance hall focused event called Sweatshop. And I only do it three or four times a year. But the, the in between is just a landing page. So the website will turn in from a ticketing link to a landing page just to sign up for email updates. And we use the, we re recycle all the old content from the last concerts, like the recap footage, or the photos, just because people loved, like back in the day on Facebook, you would go to the party and you put your photos on Facebook and everyone was like, oh my God. But like no one does that anymore in like a party sense. It's like only on like Instagram, like you have like four or five selects, you have to swipe through them. Normally they're not that great, but we just recycle that footage and that Instagram or that website ends up being just like a landing page for interest for the next one. And then we have like 
when, like before we know it, we have two or 300 more emails in between that three month hiatus that we're gonna now sell tickets to for the next event. So you can look at that from a showcase perspective if you have like a single release party or an album release party or just like some of the content from your first release. And you can kind of like dissect all the little things that you build and just create like an interest without giving up too much. Just sign up for this email list for more updates and that's just enough to get people like, okay, I'm in this like club. And then you actually start giving back and then they have something to give you back when you have releases. And, and resource sharing, right? So I know, for yeah. example, um, um, during my day job here at REC, um, I make a daily digest. And in that digest, you know, it's really hard to encapsulate all the needs that so many different types of creators need, but everybody needs money. So I know that, you know, every week I should find two to three grants that I can put in there and, and facilitate that search for people. Because when people look for us, at their, their user experience is accessibility and they're looking out for me. So, you know, being an aggregator for that information and, and resources and links that you could just reshare with their people will make them feel very thought of and, and find value in the newsletters. Great question. Um, so you guys started touching on this actually with this last question. And like you said, everybody needs money. So say you're following your advice for, so, for a few months and you start building a buzz, you, get, you start getting you know, a lot of attention online and on social media. Now, how do we turn that into like tangible income? What are some good ways as a new music artist to start turning that attention into profits? That data goes straight into a really sexy pitch deck. If y'all haven't used Canva already, I'm a Canva queen. I heard it right back there. You know the vibes. Canva allows you to create really beautiful pitch decks that, for example, if you have a brand that you really like, if it's a clothing brand, um, brands that you know have money for influencer campaigns, um, that data that you use your mental space and time on, those numbers don't lie. So when you screenshot the conversations that were had around a specific product organically with your community, uh, how much your, your user base grew, um, all that are things that you should 100%, like especially now during the end of the year, write down all the numbers for your socials and say, yo, I'm having an intentional campaign. And if the numbers didn't grow, what's that feedback telling us? And if it did, what did what what went right and how can we consider that a win to then um, you know, be able to connect ourselves to other brands? So for example, my artist, he's also a fisherman. So I connected with Orvis and all these like fly fishing companies about the conversations that are already being had about his apparel his music, what he uses. So connecting the lifestyle with yours um, has been a way to monetize and, and create bigger relationships and connect with more communities. But make that pitch deck, make those numbers talk for you. I'd also say, you know, Amuse pay monthly, which is great. It means money Boom. in your pocket super quick. Um, but also, like, I would look at, like, I would look at the data. Like, have you got a bunch of fans in New York? Would they like to do, would, you, would they like an exclusive 100 t-shirt drop where you just, you know, where that t-shirt costs you £2.50? You know, maybe you take that month. Not the pound. <laughs> Sorry, dollar. Um, you know, and, like, maybe you, look, you read that data and you go, okay, I'm going to do an, a quick exclusive drop. Because I can see I've got an audience in New York and I can mail that out quite cheap. That's like a really good way of sort of capturing that audience as well and just turning it into something, you know, that's investment, really. Um, I'm going to speak on this from like the production standpoint of shows because especially if you're building a brand or you're building a, 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 an artistic, you know, campaign or like you're building your artistry or like yourself as a performer or like a, a party that has a brand or something like that. Start building hype by doing free events, get those email lists, get everyone popping up and making sure that that shit is like slammed after like three or four because you're giving all the tickets away for free and then like as soon as you get to the point where they're, you need more capacity, then you start charging. So like my first events my, my biggest events didn't turn a profit for probably two and a half, three years, maybe longer. But because every single time they were full RSVP, when we started selling tickets, they were sold out every single time. Every three months, sold out 400 tickets every single time. But that took years. But that baby step is like so important because you can't get too hungry and you can't walk before you, you can't run before you walk. So you can't sell out a venue just off your hype alone because you have to think about the overhead. You gotta pay for the room. It's called a room nut, actually. That's the artist, hospitality, the staff, the security, the sound guy. That can probably take 1K off. So maybe you have some bread laying around, but that money's gonna go quick. You have your openers, maybe two, 300 purse act, and then you have to pay out something that might go wrong. Normally everything goes wrong. Um, but eventually you'll stop 
getting shit wrong and it gets really, really easy, but you wanna build enough hype where it's free and free and accessible to everyone and everyone's welcome. And then when you get to the point where everyone is now available to see and okay with the fact that they're gonna pay money because you gave them so much for so long, that you have a brand. Uh, my name is Julian. So I have a two part question. What do you guys think that the next great medium will be and how do we predict it? For instance, first there was radio, then television, then streaming, and now social media, which seems like it could blow up at any moment. So what do you guys think the next great medium will be and how do we predict it the way that Tierra Wag did? Thank you. Silence. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> what a question. Um, whew. I mean, I think there's a chance that we might end up looking back. Like, you know, I think that, you know, music is gonna be at the heart of it, right? Like music tends to be at the heart of these things. But m the honest answer is I have no idea. I think we're, <laughs> I think history's gonna repeat itself. We're just yeah. so tired of digital that we're going to really yearn for live Analog. music. And like w back when we used to stand in the middle of fire pits and like, you know, just like actually like talk to each other and connect. Like, I think we're so digitally fatigued that we want someone real that we can like talk to um, and experience them. Cause you know, I mean, we have artists selling thousands and thousands of dollars of live tickets because people are yearning to see that in person and not just on Twitch or, you know, a stream in real time. So if, if history is gonna repeat itself, I think technology, I think we're gonna go back to like abacuses and like chisel and I mean, rock. There, there's no denying that like some form of metaverse is gonna happen, yeah. but it needs to become accessible. But it's gonna be trash for like 10 years. And it's gonna well, it cost needs to become a lot accessible of money. first, yeah. you know, like there's so many people that don't have access to a smartphone. Like you're yeah. gonna need, the technology needs to catch up with the ideas. But as soon as that does happen, I think that it will, you know, you can, there's all sorts of AR tools that are available as well. Like I can yeah. join Zoom and be a cat. Yeah. Like, that's, that's something that's available Goals. right now, right? Um, but I think the technology needs to catch up, that the hardware needs to catch up with the software, really. I hope things simplify and I hope things go back to the human experience, but I really don't know what would be next. I really hope it's pulled back a little bit. We are so exhausted by technology. I really don't know what the next would be though. And I think it's okay to not know. I think that's why yeah. it's, it's exciting that we we're are building crafting. it now. We are literally crafting the, the now and the new and, and how we choose to engage with people online. Like, and, and I'll leave us with this like, you know, little story. I had a member who came up to me. Yo, I put my album out and only got 26 likes. And, you know, for somebody that could be really detrimental. And it's like, I'm going to delete it. I'm going to stop doing music. And instead, you know, we get to shift our mind frames and be like, yo, how many times are you on Instagram or social media and see something that you like, but you don't even press like? So those are 26 people that went out of their way to express and engage and support what you're doing. How are you starting conversations with these 26 people away from Instagram, right? Getting in their DMs and getting them in person and, and, and getting that connection solidified. So using the digital resources that we have today um, to create really authentic communities tomorrow. Say less. Let's give it up one more time for our panelists. <laughs>